Sasquatch, also known as Bigfoot or Grassman. In the South, it's referred to as Skunk Ape or Wood Booger. And across the globe, Yeti, Yowie, and Yaren, to name a few. Every Native American tribe has a name for the beast. Some as endearing as Big Brother, or as ominous as Boss of the Mountain. They've been depicted on the walls of caves for thousands of years. In 986 AD, Leif Erikson, after landing on the shores of what is now America, wrote of being attacked by large, hairy, man-like beasts. In 2016, there were over 5,500 reported sightings of these creatures worldwide. There is an abundance of physical, empirical, and anecdotal evidence of the existence of these seemingly human primates, yet it is still considered a myth. Our focus is not to research or try to prove Bigfoot exists, but to highlight the many men and women that do. My co-host Linda and I will travel the country interviewing and taking expedition with those that have the courage to call themselves cryptozoologist and Bigfoot researcher, probing and tapping into what motivates their search, showcasing their best evidence and bringing to you the different styles and methods they use to hunt this elusive creature. I'm Kerry Arnold and this is Bigfoot Odyssey. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in the scenic foothills of Missouri's Ozark Mountains. We'll be talking to Mr. Dustin Duncan, creator and host of one of my favorite podcasts, Crypto PTSD. We'll hear from Dustin, we'll hear some of his accounts and experiences, and we got him started on his own Bigfoot Odyssey. As a bonus, we'll be on location with a few of his past guests, Jay, a SWAT team member, and TJ, who had something charge him from the wood line. Hope you enjoy the show. Uh, Dustin, take us on uh, your journey from average Joe to having your own Bigfoot podcast. How, how did this all come about? From the, let's take it from the beginning. Well, I guess the beginning would be um, my arrogant youth, growing up hunting, shooting, thinking I was the bull of the woods. There was nothing out there that was bigger or better than me. Um, I loved going out with bear essentials, uh, especially squirrel hunting. I'm a real big squirrel hunter, and I use a single shot 410. It's the first gun my dad ever gave me, a little youth model. I, I love just going out in the woods, and you know, even if I didn't get anything, just walking through the woods. And I, I was pretty arrogant <clears throat> when it comes to a lot of things I should have taken into account besides Bigfoot, but. I was just a normal guy coming home one night and my life changed forever. It just got flipped upside down. I was, I lived in a small town and at, at the time I was living at my mom's house and I was coming home at probably midnight, somewhere around there. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that go looking for Bigfoot or try to find these things and that that wasn't me. Bigfoot, you know, I thought about it but I knew it wasn't here in Missouri. It, it was something that just didn't ever enter my mind because I spent time in the woods. So my sighting was was kind of the beginning but it really wasn't. Um, you know, I was coming home one night and I, I saw something that flipped my world upside down. Let's take a trip to location. Let Dustin show us exactly what happened. That is the driveway that I drove down the night that I had my siding. As I came around the curve here, I'd always hug the side of the road where that red truck bed is now. It didn't used to be there saw something run across the path and then just to the right in between the tree and the semi truck trailer is where I first saw the eye shine. Right here is where I had my siding. None of this was here at the time and the path was much wider. It was cut all the way just to the inside of the tree. Um, but whenever I saw the eye shine, it, it was right here I believe my stepdad has cut this tree back a little bit because it, it wasn't such a big gap uh, but I, I could just be remembering that wrong 
I saw the eye shine and it was that hitch right there on the side and it looks like this right here the one on the top that latch it was the height though it was probably about a foot to a foot and a half below that it was looking at me and looking across the path and it was it was quartered like this so it was looking me looking across the path and it was ducking and standing it was constantly changing levels but and i, I can't do it but it was i mean just constantly it, it was frantic like it, it was panicked it didn't know what to do kept looking over there kept looking at me at the end of it it lasted about seven seconds it was about midway up and it went down just like that and it it turned it stood all the way up and that's when i saw the actual outline and how big this thing was and it as soon as it got up it did a brief pause and then just bloop down and i didn't see it like bend down then get in on its hands and then get down it just went down now the grass was tall the only thing that was back here was a couple of pallets stacked up and i'm guessing they were in front of it but whenever it went down it had to have gone this way because i would have seen it cross the path it's with if its shoulder was touching this truck right here it was probably about this wide from my hand here to right here and the thing that I focused on was this, this these muscles right here. On a normal human, they'll come up and they kind of lay flat with the body. They will come out, but then they come back in like that. This thing, it was so big, it looked like a basketball. And down here, it actually came back up. It was, it was very unusual looking because it, it was so perfectly round on both sides. And it was so big that I felt like it, it could have picked up my truck and flipped it if it wanted to. But thankfully, it went down, and the only thing I can assume is that it went back this way towards the hauler. Never thought about it until the following year I was deer hunting and shot a deer and had a gut pile go missing. And the gut pile, for the first time, I was faced with something that I couldn't, couldn't tuck away you know couldn't tuck away in a fold and forget about it as you saw today that gut pile missing it it was under pretty almost impossible circumstances let's go take a look so you can see for yourself just how close everything was this right here is where we drug the deer we drug it back here and we drug it right there we we've already been walking back there so you can kind of see where we drug the deer to it was actually a little bit further over here to the right where i actually gutted it at i gutted it and i i had the heart and it, it had gotten dark it was almost pitch black basically night already and so we needed light and i wanted to put the heart up and i wanted a sharper knife so jordan and i came out we walked to the house when we walked through we closed the gate behind us and there's a five wire barbed wire fence that encloses this entire thing in and went into the house uh, got the knife put the heart up i mean tops 10 minutes but probably more like five minutes on our way back out i got in my truck and jordan grabbed his car we pulled back through had my truck pointing like this and his car in like this we walked back there and before we had left I flipped the deer over to drain the gut the blood out of the chest cavity from the diaphragm up I mean it was full because of the heart I hit it in the heart so I flipped them over to drain out when we were gone when we got back we walked over to it we grabbed it by its back legs and drug it right over uh, about right here at that time this path was wider uh, he used to mow it way out here and I cut the genitals off and I'm trying to split the pelvis and the leg keeps flopping over. Well, I handed the genitals to my cousin to go throw in the gut pile. And I look up and he walked over there and he's just standing there. And I'm like, hey, Jordan, 
you want a minute alone with that thing or what like come over here and help me this leg keeps flopping over because the deer was starting to get rigor mortis and he just standing there and he says dustin where's the gut pile and at the time i was very irritated because i'm thinking how do you miss a gut pile it, it was during the fall obviously this grass is all yellow and it was all beat down so it wasn't very tall either it was not what you see now and i i get up and i kind of storm over there i'm like jordan it's right here and when i get over there i can see why he was just standing there in amazement because the gut pile was gone and the blood that had that drained from the chest cavity had run up to the edge of the gut pile and the gut pile was gone so you could see Here's the blood, and this is where the gut pile was. It was starting to seep in where the gut pile had been taken. And of course, Jordan says, Dustin, what could have done that? And I didn't want to focus on it. I didn't know. I just told him, coyotes, man, come on. Let's load up my deer and get out of here. And he, he's like, Dustin, what could have done that? And I just told him, I don't know, man. Help me load this. So we loaded up the deer uh, in the back of my truck. We took it to my uncle's. I came back by myself and I came out here with a mag flashlight and I started at what now the blood puddle had totally seeped in and I, I did a circle around I take a big step out and I do another circle around because the grass was dead so it was yellow and blood on yellow grass sticks out I mean it, it's easy to see and I did laps all the way until I ran into the structures and the whole time I was thinking there's no way it ate it. I mean, there'd be bits and pieces everywhere and we weren't gone long enough. So I'm going to find the evidence by the fence. So when I got to the fence, I, in my mind, like uh, this is where I'm going to find it because an animal would have had to drug it to the fence, cross through, and then pulled it under. Nothing, not a single drop of blood, not a piece of anything was drugged behind it, nothing. On the fence, I even went over the fence and checked and I checked this whole fence here too whatever took it had to have picked it up and there was not a drop of anything after that and that's what got me to realize what was going on and and start putting things together it was gone and for the first time everything came rushing back after that and i started digging into it because i had to figure out what this was went home started doing some research and started finding out that bigfoot takes gut piles takes deer um so that that got me digging into it when it it comes to all the stuff that was happening around the property it was it's amazing at how much you can tuck away and explain away until you're you're faced with the truth and uh, we thought that there is a drunk guy coming around our property at night talking and he he wouldn't take anything he wouldn't move anything he'd just come up and talk outside the house let's go back to the house and let dustin tell us exactly how this all played out okay this is the house where i heard it speak for the first time this is when we thought there was a large drunk guy coming around our house talking at night the long story of it is is not this first window but the second window that's behind the bush is the room I stayed in with my nephew the bed was right up against the wall so the wall that separates those two rooms is exactly in the middle of those two windows and the bed was pushed up against this wall in this corner so it was literally right there on the other side of the wall I started waking up and you know for me to wake up and be groggy it's that's common but for me to wake up and be wide awake that's very uncommon and th this was happening and the first night happened and I, I woke up and I heard the cat the cat stayed in this room mom always kept that window open with a fan on to keep the air circulating and I heard the cat and it would scurry and on that wall that those two rooms share there was a bookshelf or a dresser I can't remember which but it would scurry behind it and meow so that's literally sharing the wall where the bed is here's the bed like this 
and here's the cat going behind the bookshelf so it was right there it was so annoying i didn't i don't really like cats but especially when it, and it would just meow 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 and it'd do it for hours so the first night i just thought the cat knocked something over and ran down there and started meowing so the second night same thing happens i wake up i'm wide awake i hear the cat and it runs in there and starts meowing so the third night when it happens and again i'm i'm wide awake whenever i wake up i'm listening and i'll wake up and the cat's not doing anything it's just completely silent and i i don't know if it was the third or the fourth night that i caught on to this but i heard a little pop noise and the cat after that little pop that's what made the cat scurry and it ran behind the bookshelf and started meowing and so the next night same thing happens and this is very unusual for me to do this but i did it every night in a row for about a week so the fourth night i wake up there's no noise and i'm listening for the, for the pop and like when a house creaks at night you hear a pop it wasn't that because that there's weight on it you know it's a pot but it's like muffled because of the weight so i'm listening and i hear the pop and the cat scurries underneath behind the bookshelf and starts meowing again and i'm thinking in my head what is that pop it sounded like it came from this wall over here well the last night that it happened same turn of events happened i wake up nothing's doing anything i hear the pop the cat runs under and this thing speaks outside of the window and as I'm laying on the bed if I would have stuck my hand straight up exactly on the other side of the wall from where my hands are on the height is where it sounded like it came from and the door is at the other end of the room and the door was open and it was so deep that the sound like I don't know if it shook the wall or if it was just the sound bouncing off of it but my first fear i knew that the noise came from outside directly on the other side of the wall than me and it would have had to be standing between the bush and the wall there and i hear i hear it speak but my first fear again i knew it was outside but my first fear was somebody broke in the house and they're in the house so i jump up i grab my phone and i call my mom and I'm like, she's not gonna pick up. I'm gonna have to go in there. But my thought was is, I'm gonna have to pick Jace up and take him in there with me because I wasn't gonna leave him. And my mom picks up on the third ring and she says, what's wrong? And I said, get my stepdad, tell him to get his gun, they're in the house. That, that's all I said. Hung up and I'm standing by the door and he, he ends up poking his head out. He's got his pistol, he's in his whitey tidies. And he said, where are they? And I said, I don't know. I think they're in the house. And so I waited. He came out with the pistol. Mom, I'm like, Mom, go in there and get my nephew. And we go out and we we start to run out. And <laughs> again, my stepdad's in his underwear. And I think I said something like, get the flashlight. I don't remember, but I was the first one out the door. And when I ran outside, the first thing I did was swing around here and look. There was absolutely nothing. He came out. He ended up getting dressed. We all got in the car. My mom, my nephew, my stepdad, and we drove because this driveway here, it's if you're coming down it, you're coming to our house. And if you're driving to our house, we can see you because the, the windows are right there. We drove up. First thing we did is we drove around the yard, looked. We drove back there, we drove in the backfield. Then we drove on the road and we took all the roads. There was nobody here, no vehicles here, no cars here. It only said a couple of syllables, but it was exclaiming. Like, it felt like it was like saying, no, don't. Like it was talking. Again, we thought this was a large drunk guy. And I thought what we came up with at the time is somebody was breaking in the car and it said, no, don't. Like the phrase that it said, it was exclaiming. It was like, I mean, you could tell it was trying to say something or stop something. I don't know, um, but that's that's the first time that it ever did that. And on the house there, for it to be that high, it's I'll walk over there and I'll, I'll raise my hand to where I think it, it probably was. But it had to have been very tall. You see the concrete footings down below. Then 
I think it's two by 12s for the floor joists, two by eight, something. And then the floor starts and then you've got the bed, you know, the bed's probably about this tall and then my arms up. Cause I remember it was right. Cause I was staring at the ceiling and the sound came right, right through the wall thing. And later had a, an, another occurrence happen. Um, I, I heard something outside the garage speak and it spoke three times and it said the same thing every time and my mom was with me the last time and she heard it it speak let's go back to the house and hear miss pam's account of that evening's events well dustin came in from the garage and he seemed all excited about something i didn't know what was going on and um he asked me if i heard some noises well I hadn't heard anything. Well, all of a sudden at the back door, I thought my my stepson was at the door talking and I thought I couldn't understand what he said and he speaks in a real low gruff voice and I heard what I thought was him speaking and I thought, well, he's got a key. What's he doing just standing out there? And so I looked over at Dustin and I said, what is he doing here is he supposed to be here and Dustin like looked at me and he's like I don't know um, and then he asked me what I heard and um, I couldn't make it out what I heard I just heard uh, it sounded like a man with a real deep voice now let's hear Dustin give us a detailed account of the night they heard the voices so here's where I heard it talk for the second time this right here is our garage. There's a door here, and then you probably can't see it, but straight through that window is the door to our kitchen. I was warming up noodles, and I was talking to my dad on the phone, and whenever I, I walk, and I, whenever I'm talking on the cell phone, I tend to pace, and so we have an island in the kitchen, and I, I was walking around the island in front of the door. Now, this is all speculation of what I think it was doing, but this section right here at nighttime is completely pitch black there's a light right here and a light right there and the light comes straight out but this in here is just completely black so I'm walking around and when I walk in front of the door I hear a man speak and in my mind it, it wasn't alarming I wasn't scared I thought it was my stepdad who had just got home and I didn't hear him shut the door for some reason I thought he was talking on his cell phone right there. So I did one more lap around on my next lap. I stepped in the doorway and I went to poke my head out expecting to see him. And as soon as my head went through the door jam, it spoke again. And whatever it was was standing right here. And when it did, it's like I could feel it. And I jerked. I put my hands up like this and I dropped to the ground. Like, you know, when somebody scares you and you jump. And I dropped all the way down and I, I was on the phone with my dad and I said, Dad, I gotta call you back. I backed up and I grabbed the door and I slammed it shut so he couldn't see in there anymore. <clears throat> I went back inside and my mom was putting my nephew in the bathtub and I'm like, Mom, go get, you know, go get your gun. And I, I had my gun in there and I grabbed it. I'm like, put my nephew in the other bathtub like don't put him in there and she's she was blowing it off she was like oh Dustin you're just freaking out come on and she goes and puts my nephew in there so I go and get the other gun and I'm like mom take this and she's like no I'm not I'm not taking that I'm not taking that I'm like fine so I had both the pistols and we came in the kitchen she's like what was it so we're standing in front of the the refrigerator and I'm like here come over here and we stood on the side of the refrigerator that way it was blocking the view from that door even though it was closed I didn't want to be by it so we stood on this side well, on this side of the refrigerator our back door to the patio here has a big window and you can see straight in through so I'm telling her I'm explaining to her what happened and it said the same thing the first two times but we're explaining it and whatever it was moved from here to the back door and it said the same thing it said the first two times and my mom that obviously caught her attention she's like who is that who's out there who's out there she's like is it you know my stepdad i'm like mom it call him because he's about to get shot 
so she calls him and he's in town at the store and this is at night time it's between six and nine o'clock at night he's at the store he drops everything and rushes out here of course drives around drives around the field nothing was there but it said the same thing all three times and the last time it said it it was the slowest and it said two syllables and i even asked my mom as soon as she heard it i said mom what did you hear she said oh i i heard a man speak i said no what did he say and she's like well i don't know i'm like how many syllables was it and she's like two i'm like what did they start with what was the letter and she said d and i was just confirming what i had heard again it said the same thing two times here and then one time back there and what it said was drob drew or drob droop i i don't know which one but it said the same thing all three times and of course my mom was there to hear that one so it spoke first twice at the garage window and then the third time it spoke and again it said the same thing every time this is where it, it came to we were standing on the far side of the refrigerator and you can I mean, literally you, you can see straight in there especially at night with the lights on I mean even standing out here you'd be able to see us but we were both standing there and when it spoke the first thing we both did is we moved to the other side of the refrigerator because we knew it could see us because it, it was standing right here whenever it said it the last time what what real significant changes would you say happened after after his experiences well dustin has always hunted ever since he was nine or ten years old with his uncle and he's never seemed to be afraid of you know anything out in the woods um he hadn't told me a lot for a long time what had happened and i kept noticing that he, he wanted me to keep jason in the house my grandson in the house and he was like mom what are you guys doing he'd call and i'd be like playing he's outside playing on the swing set mom i told you because he had talked to me he did not want me letting him outside of the house he didn't want me to go outside of the house at dark unless my husband was home um when he would come and spend the night he would sleep on the couch in the living room he would pull the blinds i've got like a window in my back door he would take paper towels and put magnets up to so nobody can so nothing can look in and he can't sleep and he'd put the gun right you know close to where he was laying and i'm like what is wrong with you well he finally told me what was going on and um he doesn't even like to drive down my gravel road at night if it gets dark outside he prefers i mean i think he prefers me to even like come to the door when he pulls up and walk in with them a lot of times when he's leaving at night he asks me to walk out with him so i'll go to the garage door and until he gets in the car and walk out with him um i've never seen him like this about anything well, um, personally, uh, I can absolutely relate, as I'm sure a lot of our viewers can also. Well, now, was this before or after you heard the voices? This? That you noticed the changes? Well, I noticed something was going on before he even told me that he, what he saw. And I couldn't understand it because he had this long conversation with me about, you know, um, n not going outside after dark not let my you know grandson play on the swing set that's right out the back door by himself even in the bro even in broad daylight he told me if i hear noises hitting the tree like a stick hitting a tree to run in the house and i'm thinking what is going on i mean i didn't understand it and then after he told me what he saw then it all started making sense i went back after the gut pile and I started putting all these things that were happening around the property together and, and researching into it and finding like, you know, the, the speaking that sounds like English but you can't understand. Bigfoot, check. No other animals, no nothing that, that I could find on the internet. The, what I saw, the eye shine, the height, the body, you know, whenever I, I drove down the driveway that night and I saw it, I thought it was a monster. 
I never thought Bigfoot. Not one time did that ever come in my head. I thought I saw a monster, and then I guess I, I blocked it out mentally. That, you know, and, and before that happened, I thought people that said that were, you know, they made that up to hide from something they did. I, I don't know if that's what it was, but that, that's what I did in, until the gut pile. And then I, I decided to tell my family about it. You know, I've got a nephew that lives at the house, and the way my mom, you know, let him play outside and stuff, just like she did with me when I was a kid, you know, that's stuff that bothered me. Family members that I loved out hunting, not knowing it was out there, if something ever happened to them, you know, it's either I keep my mouth shut or I tell them and I get made fun of. And, you know, I I made that decision to, to tell everybody and whenever I told my family of course you get you know mixed reviews on that but one night talking to my mom about it she said well then just go outside and show me I'm like well it doesn't work that way you know it and she's like well why not I'm like fine we go out there and we start shining and sure enough there there's one sitting across or the only thing I can believe it, it was was a Bigfoot you know its eyes were about like that about that far apart uh, down in the hauler and she saw it as, as well as me it, it stared at us she ended up whooping at it and it started looking over to its right and back and starting getting fidgety and we got a little nervous so we went inside let's track back and hear miss pam's version of the night they saw the eye shine well we went out we were it was dark and we were outside and i think he had either was getting ready to leave or he had just pulled up and he had his gun and um, he was talking about, you know, seeing the eye shine that he saw. And um, I was like, I think, I, I don't know if I took a flashlight and started like, he's like, Mom, don't do that. And I'm like, why? I said, let's see if we can see something. He's like, no. Well, then I talked him into it. So was it, was it your gun? Oh, flashlight on my pistol. He took it and he just started scanning the the woods right next to the house and we both saw eye shine and it was like it was looking at us and then it would turn and then it would look back and the eyes were really big I was thinking they were what color we argued about it at first. I thought they were blue. You thought they were green. I thought they were like a yellowish. And then, um, once we realized that it was the angle and it started, remember you whooped at it because you were trying to get it to move because it wouldn't move. And then it started looking and um, then it was white after that. They were just like a white color. But when it was staring straight at us, I, from what I remember, they were blue and you said they were green. And then when it started looking back and forth, they were just white. It was like a white color. Any way it could have possibly been a deer? No, because I don't think a deer would have been like what, you know, it was far enough out in the woods that it wouldn't have been like watching us because it seemed like it was watching us. Right. And it stayed there for a long time. And Dustin then told me, Mom, don't ever make whooping noises outside. <laughs> so... I don't do that either. But it's changed me too in that every time I come down that gravel road, I look over by the tractor trailer and I'm looking for eye shine or something to move. I even flip my high beams on and anytime I step out that back door, I scan the area. Sometimes I even get a telescope out and just look to see if I can see anything because I told Dustin one time, I said, I would love to see what you saw. And he goes, no, you wouldn't. Now it doesn't get much more genuine than that. We want to thank Miss Pam for taking the time to give us her version of those events. Thank you again, Miss Pam. I started thinking back to whenever I worked at the sawmill and I'd get home, you know, I'd be dirty, I'd sit on the back porch and there would be this feeling that would come over me you know it, it would get dark i'd be playing on my phone or watching netflix youtube on my phone and i i get this feeling that something was wrong and something was watching me let's take a quick look at how dustin recounts having those feelings after coming in from work 
So this is where I'd come sit after I got done working at the sawmill when I was dirty. Didn't feel like taking a shower yet. So I would come back here just to kind of relax. And I would watch YouTube on my phone, watch Netflix on my phone, play games on my phone, whatever. And a lot of times it would, it would get dark back here. And I would take the chair and I would face it like this and I'd put it up. And I'd be sitting there and I'd just get a feeling all of a sudden real intense that something's watching me. And like I talked about earlier, this spot over here and over here is pitch black at night. And so I would get up with my cell phone light and I would come over here and I would shine it and I would peek around that corner and I'd peek around that corner. And sometimes Shelby would be sitting down there and the pool wasn't there then. She'd be sitting there and this dog would bark at everything. But she would look up at me and her ears would come up and then she'd look over there to the left of the garage and her ears would lay down and she'd lower her head and she'd look back up at me her ears would come up and she'd lower her head and lay her ears back and look it like she was going to growl except she would never growl she'd always be silent and i just have that creepy feeling and that happened a lot and that was before i started putting things together of what was going on out here so of course i was oblivious to the fact of what could be i just would get a creepy feeling enough to get up and I know sometimes that it seemed like the dog was, was looking at something too. There are so many things that happen around here that just get overlooked because we had no idea what was actually going on. And so after that, you know, of course, everywhere I go, I'm watching the wood line, uh, I'm, I'm looking and I, I have a job that I work seasonal and I won't go into it but in the full time I when I get back I I run a mowing crew for a, a mowing company and we mow in really rural areas. Dustin took us to the cemetery to check out some of these tree structures. You can see this one is uh, bent down and the forks wrapped around this other large oak tree. Uh, this one it looked like it was just obviously placed there. There's no stump first. And you can see these other limbs that are they're broken off on either end or twisted off. And they're just kind of leaned up against it. Um, this doesn't look very natural. You can see that's obviously twisted off wherever it came from. Uh, this one is, there's no stump. That's stuck down in the ground. And it, it probably doesn't look very heavy, but I'm pretty positive a man couldn't have leaned that up and then wove it up into that other tree. And you know, once your eyes get open to it and you see it, you you can't unsee it. You know, it's like before you can't see what you're not looking for. That's why you know most people don't see anything. But once your eyes get open to it, you just you can't turn a blind eye to it. And so. You know, mowing at, at a cemetery and a shooting range, I found these structures and they're right there. You know, people come to these places all the time, especially that shooting range, and they're just inside the wood line. And Dustin took us out to the shooting range to uh, see some of these tree structures. Now, this was uh, this one was pretty hard to debunk. You know, I tried to uh, be objective and leave my confirmation bias at home, but uh, this just was not natural you can see the one that's bent down is the fork is tucked over the one under it and then tucked back around uh, the bottom side <clears throat> now this this long tree that's leaned up um i mean did it fall that way it would have had to have fallen from somewhere else because there's no stump and before it fell, all the limbs fell off and the top broke out of it. So that's this long limb there is our tree. It's it's broken off on either end. Oh, that that was pretty fantastic. But you can see here there's no there's no stump. That's rocks. There's a lot of rocks around there. And then all these smaller sticks leaned up against it. That would, uh, if you didn't know any better, you, know, you wouldn't think anything of it. But you know, just investigating it, pretty hard to uh, to debunk that. 
Uh, this one, this this one was pretty fantastic. Uh, again, broken off on either end. It's uh, but if you look, that fork is it's tucked around the the live tree that's growing up there, and then there's another smaller stick kind of just leaned up against it. Now, could someone have done that? Probably, but this log, that's that's got to be well over a thousand pounds, and where's the stump I mean there's no <laughs> there's that's just rocks you know there's there's just no way someone brought that in there this was uh, pretty impressive and you can see the one below it is 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 laced in between those trees and again where's the stump there's just not one so it, it was either drug in there or <laughs> I don't know. It fell from somewhere else. I couldn't explain it. And I found a footprint at, at that same place, a very wide footprint. Now it wasn't that big because it was just the, the toes and the ball of the foot, but the, the cemetery, the, the one that's there is, is huge. And that one is, very hard to swallow and I think I'm one of the I think I'm the only guy that knows about it other than the couple of people I've showed it to and it's just right there like, you know you got the cemetery step in the wood line and and you can see it it was it turned me from an average Joe into what I am today and starting my show was kind of a uh, I wanted to help others, but if I'm being completely honest, it was probably to help me because after the gut pile had gotten taken, I literally, and I'm not exaggerating, I listened to, I started with Sasquatch Chronicles, you know, Wes Germer. I listened to him every day, all day, for two years. I never missed a day, and I, <laughs> I know I did. And then I started getting into other shows and I started thinking, you know, I just can't get enough. This listening to other people makes me feel better about myself and what I saw and I don't feel as crazy. You don't feel crazy. Exactly. And I started thinking, you know, Wes Germer, he's such a humble guy, but I think why his show was so successful is because he could just be folded into my family just like that I mean he's easy going guy he's a and I, I started thinking he's just a normal guy that just had an encounter and decided to start a podcast he's easy to listen to though. exactly and I thought why can't I do that I wanted the extra encounters because you know Wes Germer post shows but he gets more than that on the side and that's what I wanted because that's what I was searching for was these encounters and I just thought you know I, I think I can I can do it like he does maybe not as good as he does it but I can do it like he does and I can get these extra encounters and if, if I'm being completely honest I think it was mainly to help myself without admitting to it you know I love helping other people and uh, talking to other people about what they went through but it's it helps me at the end of the day. It helps me sleep. Yeah, the good. guest is is what you come to listen to, and basically, it's if the host will gal get out of the way and let it happen or not. You know, right. those are the easy ones. I to think you kind of had to learn that. Yeah, in the beginning, yeah. right? My my <laughs> first few shows are are pretty rough, but I, I've got it to kind of a system where I let them talk, and then once they get done, I I ask them questions, and that just comes from. I'm a simple guy, so I have to paint a picture in my head, but I think it helps others paint that same picture. It, it, it's exciting to see, you know, the, the whole thing that got me into it, you know, like with Wes, was from normal guy, encounter, to, to what he is now. And I think learning the backstory, you know, it's one thing to hear it and paint that picture, but when you actually get to see the places they were and what happened and why, I think I think it, it's very interesting, uh, especially for a, a, a video and not just an audio. 
Speaking of interesting, this next clip is of an incident that I'm sure helped push Dustin right along on his Bigfoot Odyssey. We're headed into the wood line where they set up a tree stand to deer hunt. Uh, I actually picked up a tick going through here, but this is only about 200 yards from the house. Okay, so as you can see, this tree stand, it's all one piece and it is very, very heavy. Um, we, I was hoping my stepbrother put that up. It was me, my stepbrother, my buddy TJ, and uh, my stepdad. So what we did is we threw a rope over that limb there and we pulled the truck down right here and we hooked the rope to a cable and we were backing up the hill there and pull, we pulled this up. So once it got up, I was sitting in the truck, sitting on the brake, keeping it there. Once they got the first strap around, I put it in park and got out and came uh, just a few feet in behind Carrie there. I was standing there, TJ was standing here, my stepbrother was up in there, and then we had a ladder right here going up, and my stepfather was up there helping him strap it. And as I'm standing there, I, I hear from almost directly behind me something stomping on two legs, and it was walking this way, breaking sticks. It sounded like whatever it was, it was not trying to be quiet. I'm standing next to an injected 350 that's idling and so in my mind of course I'm like I'm just hearing stuff this is I'm just making it up and it, it goes all the way around and this probably took it about five to seven minutes because it, it would just stomp and then stop I wouldn't hear it at all and I'd hear it again and it circled all the way around and there's a pond right there and I was hearing sticks break so I know it didn't go around the pond and that's probably only about 25 30 yards away from us it may look farther but it's not mm -hmm. and it went all the way around and down in the bottom down here there's less trees it's a little little valley down there whatever you want to call it and it kind of stopping and going but it's just stomping and breaking stuff as it's walking and as it gets farther around, I step down closer away from the truck so I can hear better. And the whole time, I'm, I'm not telling them because I, I'm the crazy Bigfoot guy. So I'm listening as it's, as it's coming around, coming around. And it finally gets to where it's, it's right there behind that tree. Except it's, I, I don't know, 20 yards behind it. And it stops and it starts coming straight in at us and it's going ch -ch 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 -ch, and stopping and it, it stopped longer than it was moving and then ch -ch 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 -ch, and it was coming in so i asked tj i'm like dude give me that flashlight it was just a little keychain flashlight it wasn't very good and i was shining it at that tree which you really couldn't even see it i mean you could kind of see the bark on the tree and i had my pistol pulled and out and in my head i'm thinking I'm not gonna say anything because I don't wanna look stupid. I'm just gonna shoot if I see something. Cause that, at that time, I mean, this thing was coming in on us and I, I was scared. So it comes all the way in to where it's right behind that tree and it, it hasn't made any more noises and it kept shuffling its way in. And I'm waiting for it to poke its head out. I've, I even took slack off the trigger. Well, TJ notices that I'm serious about seeing something. And my stepbrother goes, uh, guys, there's something big and it's coming right at us. And I'm like, thank goodness he said something because I wasn't going to say it. I was going to shoot first. And my stepfather goes, no, -uh, where? He goes, right where Dustin's shining that light. And my stepfather gets in the truck and he had a spotlight in the truck. So he's shining down there and I'm telling my stepbrother, dude you better hurry up because we're leaving it's right there i've heard it the whole time and you know they're asking where where was it where did it come from i'm like it came all the way around and it came in there get come on let's go get in the truck and we load up and left we never saw anything he's hunted in it afterwards but the steps i heard going around were 100 percent bipedal and it was just snapping stuff on along the way it did not care and then when it got there it never poked its head out that I saw. 
um, I'm just happy he said something because it was so obvious when it started shuffling and coming in stopping and going stopping and going and it, it was literally in a straight line from where I was coming in um, I I just guess that they heard the commotion because we were you know the truck was spinning its tires going up the hill pulling that up and it, it wanted to see what we were doing. That's uh, the only thing I can come up with. But it, it didn't do nothing. And it didn't do nothing in the stand. I secretly thought that we'd come back and the stand would be all bent up. But it never did anything. Now let's take a trip to location and hear from one of Dustin's first guests, SWAT team member, Jay. We're here on location with Jay. This was uh, the third show of Crypto PTSD. And uh, Jay's going to tell us about what happened that night. Jay, what happened? What were you doing? Well, me and a buddy of mine, <clears throat> we decided to come out here. It's a very rural location. We're going to come out here, set up a campfire, and just do some goofy stuff. We're going to shoot some spray paint cans and make fireballs. Just come out here and have a good time. Fun stuff. But it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we came down here. Ended up in the parking lot. I had a 22 rifle with me. And I noticed when I got out of the car that it was just eerily silent. Um, I've been out in the woods my whole life, so... I thought it was strange. It was more quiet than it ought to be. So I, I announced that, that I'm here. I said, is anybody out here? I got a rifle. So I'm going to do some shooting. But nobody called back or answered back. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm just being nervous. So shut the door. I walk around to the passenger side of the car. And my buddy John had stood up about that time between the door and the car. He just stayed there. I could tell he was nervous. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, he just seemed a little nervous that night. I think we were telling ghost stories or something on the way down. But we stood there talking for just a few minutes. And uh, as I was standing there talking, uh, this really strange, out of nowhere sound from right back here came. It was, it was just like a, like a banshee from hell. Like it was screaming right at me. I could feel it in my, in my bones almost. And uh, I just instinctually, I started shooting my little 22 rifle towards that direction because it, mm -hmm. it scared me so bad. And uh, John did the smart thing. He sat down in the car and shut the door. And I kind of yelled at him like, what are you doing, man? Leave me out here by myself. I didn't have a flashlight or anything to see in here. And like I said, 2 o'clock in the morning, so this is pitch black. But I knew the area. So, um, John sat down. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you say loud. You mean like, uh, not like any other animal you've ever heard. Before. I've never heard anything else like it in my life, out in the woods, out in the community, nothing like it. So, uh, I couldn't describe it. I mean, the best thing or the closest thing I can think is uh, like a large cat. But I, I don't know why a large cat would have screamed to me at two o'clock in the morning, especially right. when it didn't seem like there was anything else going on or moving. So, so you think that's a possibility that it could have been a large cat? Uh, I, I'm going to say that's the closest sound that I can think of in nature, but I have no idea what it was. So uh, I, I've never seen any large cats out here. I've seen bobcats, and uh, as far as I know, bobcats they don't make a noise like that. So, right. But at that point, I walked around the side of the car. I got in and. Uh, we uh, we headed out of here. I told him don't even look back. Uh, right. We could, so. And you'd been out here before, after that, never heard anything else like that since? I've been out here after that, never heard anything since. I actually used to live about five miles down from here uh, back in the 90s when I was growing up. Spent a lot of time in the woods then uh, and time in, at nighttime and never heard anything at that time either. What do you think about Bigfoot? Do you believe in Bigfoot? you think it's possible? I want it to be. Right. But I'm one of those guys, uh, maybe it's just because I'm from Missouri, i got to see it before I believe it. As far as that night goes, I'm just going to, you know, say I don't know. I don't know what it was. Well, I mean, this is, this is a BFRO hotspot. Yeah. So there have been quite a few sightings around yep. just right in this area. I think we're going to go see TJ later. And anybody, anybody that looks at this in the summertime, I mean, it's a good hiding spot. I mean... There could be 20 guys sitting back here right, right now, and we wouldn't be able to see them. So, especially you know, those guys. Yeah, especially those guys. Right, believe me. <laughs> so yeah, this kind of area, I, I could see uh, it'd be easy to hide. Now, you've known Dustin for how long? We grew up together. We're we're cousins, so we we've known each other our whole life. So you know what happened to him? And I he, do. He told you everything. And I do. Tell us how how did he how did it change him? How has he changed <laughs> from that point till till now? Well, I've never seen Dustin focus on anything necessarily so much in his life until that happened, and it's become a main focus of his life. So you know something happened. Something happened. I don't know what. Something happened. So. Man, doesn't it ring true that encounters just like Dustin had will cause you to make some significant changes in your life? I want to thank Jade for coming out and meeting us on location. 
We know you were tired, buddy. We certainly appreciate it. Now let's head up the road and meet TJ, where he had his encounter. We're here on location with TJ, and uh, we're just about right in the middle of where Dustin had his encounter and where Jay had something scream at him in the woods. Now, TJ, you want to tell us what happened that night? Yeah, um, about a mile down the road, we broke down my mom's car. I mean, I was probably 10 years old, had my sister with us. We had to walk home. It's about a mile and a half, two miles back down this way. Well, we get about right here. As you see, I mean, the trees cover the road. It's right. pretty dark. And all of a sudden, I mean, it just sounded like something crashing through the woods right here. I'd say it come plumb to this tree line right here in front of us and then just stop. Couldn't hear nothing. Which is about 15 feet away. Yeah. And, I mean, I was so young then. I was on my mom's back as fast as I heard it coming. And mom just kind of fast she could go down the road. But it was definitely something big and definitely something. It was big. Yeah, it had to be big. Coming, coming toward you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you hear that a lot. I've experienced it myself. You know, you're deer hunting and you hear the, the big crash coming through the woods and you think it's the big buck about to come out and it just stops right there and nothing ever comes out. So and it's not till later that you look back and think that, you know, this possibly could have been one of these things and not a deer at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, this is the midpoint between where you had your encounter and where Jay and this, this whole proximity is, is just within a mile, mile and a half of each other, right? Yeah. And this is, I mean, where we are here, this is a BFRO hotspot. So we know what's here. We know what it likely was. I believe that's what it was anyway. I mean, there's very little else you could imagine it could be. There's not really anything around here that sounds like a truck crashing through the woods. Right, uh, absolutely. Uh, especially towards you. Yeah. Maybe running away, Yeah. but not towards you. Well, TJ, we appreciate you coming out, man. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. Well, we made it back home, back to Mississippi. Uh, how was Missouri? Loved it. Very beautiful country. Um, very thick woods. The ground that we was walking on, and I think that was one thing I really wanted you to illustrate was not level. It's rocks. You're, you're not walking on dirt and, and mostly, yeah. Right. Oh my gosh, it was so rocky. I almost fell twice. So nobody's going to just run through that. So, a lot different woods than we're used yeah, to. Yeah, a lot sure. different. There's, you don't have the pine trees we have. No, a lot of oak, a lot of yeah, hardwood. But it was absolutely beautiful scenery. Very thick scenery. So it, I can see how anything could hide in it. Well, you know, it's our first show. Uh, I don't think we did bad at all, you know, considering everything that we had to go through and, you know, the whole idea. And obviously we're going to get better at it. But, uh, Dustin, Dun Dustin Duncan and uh, Crypto PTSD. How about that, huh? Hmm. Love meeting Dustin. Love meeting his mom. Pam. Yeah. Miss Pam was, um, and I think that was my big thing about the whole trip is, is I'm a mother. You know, we know how our kids do sometimes. And to hear the mother side of it saying, you know, this is what my kid hurt. I know he did. I know how it's changed him. So it, it was very nice to see that and hear that. So... Well, you, you couldn't meet better nice people. Nice people. I Very mean, nice absolutely. people. Absolutely. And we definitely appreciate Dustin and Miss Pam, you know, opening up their home to us and just taking the time, you know, to shoot the show. Uh, Dustin really, really did me a favor on this one or did us a favor on this one. Uh, we are, uh, are going to be doing some traveling. Um, got, you know, more shows to shoot. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to to shoot a show if you have uh, you know like if your eyeballs deep in this because of something that happened to you we will we'll travel to you and we'll, we'll shoot an episode um, you can contact us at uh, bigfoot odyssey at gmail.com and uh, anything else um, just thank y'all very much for for taking up the time yes with thank you really dustin thank you miss pam uh, thank you, Jay. We know you were tired, buddy. And uh, 
And thanks, TJ. You know, we appreciate everybody that uh, that pitched in and and was a trooper for us. We maybe, thank you all. Yeah, maybe next time Missouri can be a trip for us because I'd <laughs> like to see a lot of more things. So. Right. But uh, join us on the uh, next Bigfoot Odyssey, and thank you.